turn on the farm road off of Southland Road in the far south side of San Antonio, Texas, about one mile away from the haunted ghost tracks, and passing by an active juvenile detention center, is a group of abandoned buildings that most San Antonians know as the Abandoned Insane Asylum. Now first and foremost, I want to say that this is not going to be an urban exploration or ghost hunting type of video. This is going to be more of an investigative as well as an informative type of video that will explain the history of this place and the dark events that took place here. Now there are many reasons why I didn't want to trespass on this property. One, because it's owned by Bear County. Two, there are signs posted saying no trespassing. Three, there is a gate, as you can see here, wide open. However, there is a camera just waiting for you to trespass. And also for other reasons like this. Yeah, this looks like this used to be a cafeteria. Oh, hi. Okay. So yeah, being there by myself, I didn't want to take the risk of running into a squatter or getting arrested. So throughout this video, I will show whatever video footage I took of this place, as well as newspaper clippings, photos, and clips from other YouTubers who were brave enough to explore this abandoned insane asylum, and will definitely cite my sources and give credit to what is shown in this video. So let's get started. Our investigation begins at the intersection of Mulberry and North St. Mary Street, about five minutes away from downtown San Antonio and about a minute away from the San Antonio Zoo. Now you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the abandoned insane asylum? Well, its origins begin right here. The grounds and the buildings that you see here are very well kept and extravagant. However, what was here before was very dark, gritty, and gloomy. Here is a bird's eye view of North St. Mary's and Mulberry Street. And here is a Sanborn map from 1912 showing Mulberry Street being Olympian Way and North St. Mary's being Jones Avenue. And at the intersection, there was a place known as the Poor Farm. The building that you see here is the old Bear County Poor Farm, which served its purpose from 1861 to 1915 at this site. It all started in 1849 when the county commissioner's court made an order making it the duty of the court to support and bury indigents of the county and asserting it is the duty of the city to maintain and bury its paupers. At first I didn't know the difference between pauper and indigent person. However, a pauper is one who is extremely poor, while an indigent is a person who is in need or in poverty. For example, like an elderly person who is no longer able to work and is living off whatever money they have left. Mind you, this was a time when social security wasn't around. So, from this article, it looks like it was the court's job to offer assistance to the people in need, while it was the city's job to offer the penniless shelter, food, and medical assistance at the poor farm. However, indigents did find themselves moving to the poor farm after tragically losing their home or becoming too old and no one was around to take care of them. The house that you see here at the poor farm sat on 18 and a half acres of land and had about 75 to 100 residents. And in the late 1800s, when the tuberculosis cases were on the rise, there was a colony made on the property for tuberculosis patients. And sadly, for those who had no next of kin or who were too poor to be buried in an ordinary cemetery, they were buried at a pauper's grave on the site. In the early 1900s, the poor farm took up a lot of publicity on the local newspapers. Here we have a clipping from 1908 saying that there was going to be new rules for being admitted into the poor farm. The people who wanted to live on the poor farm had to be residents of Bear County for at least six months and had to have a certificate signed by two people who lived on the county saying that the person was in need of assistance. Here is an example of a resident who lived on the Bear County poor farm. However, the photographer or newspaper columnist didn't really have nice words to say about this person, pretty much calling him a low-grade imbecile and a waste of life. Many residents of the Bear County Poor Farm made it onto newspaper articles. However, this following newspaper clip was probably the darkest story that I have found by far. On December 30th, 1904, the San Antonio Daily Light had an article about the death of Henry Push, a resident of the Bear County Poor Farm. Henry Push was found hanging from a tree near the Poor Farm. A man by the name of Ernest Ketzinger knew this man for about a year and claimed that ever since he knew him, Henry Push was always talking about suicide. Sebastian Bass was a sexton who worked at the poor farm. One day Sebastian was digging up graves and Henry Push walked up to him and said, I would like to be buried right here. Plot number 129. Sebastian looked at Henry and said, I don't think you're going to die anytime soon. 
Henry then replied, I bet you I will be dead within 24 hours. And the next day, Henry Push was found hanging from a mesquite tree near the poor farm. It was later ruled that it was a suicide by hanging and there was no foul play. On June 22, 1907, the property known as the Bear County Poor Farm was scheduled to be auctioned off. The city officials knew that this property was high in value, estimated to be $1,000 per acre. Also, the property was an eyesore, and the city officials wanted to move the undesirable people as far away as possible from downtown San Antonio. So with 18 acres of land, the city was wanting to make at least 18000 on the property. However, on the day of the auction, the highest bid that they received was 12000 probably because the people looked at the property and saw the poor farm and the cemetery with it and really had no interest in the property. In this article, you could see that they mentioned that the poor farm was not self-sustainable and was costing the taxpayers and the county a lot of money, and that they were looking for a new site for a new poor farm where it could be self-sustainable and a place where people could grow crops and run an actual working farm. Also, I'd like to mention that this bid of $12,000 was never agreed upon because the city was really looking for $18,000 for this property. An article from the San Antonio Light on January 8, 1909 mentions that the county commissioners were on the lookout for a new site for the new Bear County Poorhouse. The commissioners knew that a new poor farm was badly needed, so they were interested on a piece of land near the Salado Creek in the far south side of San Antonio. On this piece of land, they felt that crops could be grown here by the people who lived on the poor farm, making it self-sustainable. From the San Antonio Light and Gazette, on February 25, 1910, county commissioners purchased 100 acres of land from a William Meyer near the Salado Creek, which is by the present-day Southend Road and Farm Road. Also in this article, it further explains that residents of the poor farm will work the property and grow crops on this land. Here we have the deed of how much was spent for this property. A total of $7,500 was paid to William Meyer for the 100 acres of land. An article from the San Antonio Light and Gazette on September 11, 1910 mentions that county commissioners were once again putting the present site of the poor farm up for auction. This time they were looking for $25,000 for the property, so that way they could use that money to build a new facility on the recently purchased 100 acres of land for the new poor farm site. From the San Antonio Light and Gazette on December 1, 1910, there was a news article mentioning a new Bear County Detention Hospital being built on the future site of the Bear County Poor Farm. At this hospital, people with contagious diseases were going to be treated here, and it mentions that this new hospital was state of the art. It also mentions that this hospital was going to be off limits to future residents of the new Bear County Poor Farm. On February 12, 1911, there was a very weird news article that was published on the newspaper mentions that a total of 2,500 grave sites at the Popper's Graveyard, also known as the Potter's Field on the Bear County Poor Farm site, was going to be bulldozed and leveled off. At this time, Bear County was still trying to sell off the land, and I believe they were doing this so that way the land would look more attractive to any future buyer. It mentions that future burials were going to take place at the future site of the new Poor Farm, it also mentions that unless relatives were to pick up their relatives' remains at the present-day pauper's grave at the Bear County Poor Farm, that they were just going to be left where they're at and that future landowners would just have to build on top of them. In this news article, the news reporter looks through the causes of death from the few of the many people buried at this present-day pauper's graveyard. Feel free to pause and read through these articles to actually get an understanding of the people that lived on this poor farm or who were too poor to be buried at a regular cemetery. The following screenshots are listed 1 through 10. Once you reach number 10, you are on the last page of this news article. If you want to skip this part, skip to 10 minutes and 20 seconds to move on in this video.
So after reading that news article, you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, there's currently 2,500 bodies laying at the present day site of North St. Mary's and Mulberry Street? Well, I thought that too at first, but not exactly. According to the San Antonio Light, on July 27, 1913, county commissioners ordered the remains of the 2,500 people buried at the present poor farm site to be removed. The known dead were going to be moved to City Cemetery Number 7, while the other unknown were going to be buried at a grave site at the new poor farm site. Once again, they were trying to sell the property for at least $18,000, and they felt that if they were to actually remove the bodies, that people would actually be interested in purchasing this land, so that way that they could use this money for the new poor farm. Not only were they looking to build a new poor farm on the 100 acre site, they were looking to build a tuberculosis colony as well as a training school for juvenile boys. On August 3, 1913, an article from the San Antonio Light mentioned that the Zizek Undertaking Company had removed all the bodies from the present day poor farm site and reburied the bodies at City Cemetery Number 7, where each body received a separate grave and each grave received its own headstone. Now what's funny is that in 1944, the city sold the cemetery and removed the remains and reburied them at San Jose Burial Park. Where St. Gerard's Catholic School is here in the center of your screen is where City Cemetery Number 7 used to be. So the people who were buried at the first poor farm site were not reburied only once, but twice, which is really sad. Here is a 1912 map of the Bear County poor farm layout. On the bottom of your screen, there is an area labeled Cemetery, where this was the Potter's Field or Popper's Graveyard. And here is video footage of me today checking out where I believe the cemetery was once at. Walking away from the intersection of North St. Mary's and Mulberry Street, past these buildings, on this grassy area right over here near the access road at 281, is where I believe the Potter's Field or Popper's Graveyard was once at. It's also quite possible that the graveyard extended all the way to where the bridge is. A news article from the San Antonio Light on November 11th, 1913, was urging taxpayers to vote for a bond of $1 million where some of that money was going to be used to build a new poor farm on the 100 acre site that they bought years prior. In this article, it also explains the current conditions of the Bear County poor farm, explaining that there is vermin in the walls and that the whole building was pretty much falling apart, as well as the causes of death at the poor farm were because of the poor conditions of this place. It also explains that it is not the people's fault that live there, it's the county's fault for not taking care of the people who are pauper and indigents. After this persuasive news article, the taxpayers voted yes on this bond issue and the county received its $1 million in bonds. A news article from December 28, 1913 explains that the county was going to work hard next year in making plans and finding bids for contractors to build this new home for indigents and paupers on this new Bear County poor farm site. After unsuccessfully selling the land where the current poor farm site was at, it looks like they finally got the money to get the ball rolling on this project. On April 6, 1914, there was a news article mentioning that the county was interested in two tracts of land next to their new poor farm site. They wanted to purchase one of these tracts of land to build a new juvenile home for delinquent boys, as well as a new detention hospital. So the county got what it wanted, purchasing an additional 165 acres of land from H.C. Feldman for the amount of $12,942.30, making it a grand total of 265 acres at this new poor farm site. Here is the deed showing the purchase of the land on May 8, 1914, for the amount of actually $12,932.30. So after seven long years, the county finally started construction on the new home to place the paupers and indigent people in on this 265 acres of land owned by Bear County. Here you can see the progress of this new home from October of 1914 to February of 1915. On March 29, 1915, a news article from the San Antonio Light mentioned that the new home for the age was ready to replace the old poor farm, and that residents were going to be moved into this new facility on April 1, 1915. You're probably wondering, why did I use the term home for the age instead of poor farm or poor house? 
While the county felt that those terms, poor farm and poor house, were more of a derogatory term when most of the people that lived there who were elderly had no other choice but to turn to the county for help because they had little to no money or they lost their homes completely. This article explains the details of this building, mentioning that it is built like a huge T and that it has electric light, steam heating, shower baths, sleeping porches, a roof garden, and all the comforts of a home, which the prior home did not have. The building itself could hold up to 150 residents. However, the building was designed so that additional wings could be made if more room was needed in the future. The article also states that the tuberculosis colony, which was at the old poor farm site, was going to be moved near the new home for the aged, yet far enough to where it's not obtrusive. The article touches on the old poor farm site, mentioning that once again it was built in 1861 and that the doctor at the site condemned the building for many years. Residents like Juanita Rodriguez, who was nearing close to 120 years old, was very excited to be moving from the old poor farm to the new home for the aged. Juanita Rodriguez lost her home five years prior and had no other choice but to move to the poor farm. In May of 1915, plans were to be made to build the juvenile home for delinquent boys on the site. This was going to be a place where troubled young boys could live and work on the county farm, learn a trade, and become reformed and stay out of trouble. A news article from the San Antonio Light on December 17, 1915, mentions that 10 acres of the old Bear County Poor Farm property was to be leased out for a total of $30 for one year. So it just goes to show that even though the property was abandoned for quite some time, no one was interested in buying the property for the amount that the county was asking for. On November 26, 1917, Bear County purchases 111 acres of land from Gideon Meyer for the amount of $8,000, making the county farm 376 acres in total. Throughout the years, the county farm showed that it was self-sustainable. However, with the juvenile home for delinquent boys on the site, there were mysterious and dark circumstances that took place here that I'm about to share with you. A news article from the San Antonio Light on January 23, 1925, mentions that a boy named Alfred Garcia, who lived at the juvenile home at the county farm, was found unconscious Thursday night. The boy did survive, however, they did find rat poison in his system. The article doesn't explain if the boy ate this rat poison intentionally or if it was mixed in with this food. The article does state that the boy was reprimanded Thursday afternoon, so was that person responsible for putting rat poison in his food? Who knows? Luckily, this inmate survived. However, the following inmate was not so lucky. On November 16, 1933, there was a news article from the San Antonio Light that mentioned 13-year-old boy Charles Allen Watson, an inmate of the juvenile boy's home at the county farm, who was found dead just one mile away from the farm at the Salado Creek. The story starts off with deputies having a suspect in mind, a 21-year-old dairy worker who worked at the county farm who had bloodstained overalls underneath his mattress. The boys at the juvenile boys' home were sent around the area to look for objects that could have been used to kill Charles Allen Watson. Watson had been missing since November 2nd and was found on November 15th by Tiburcio Samadillo while fishing along the Salado Creek, which is the man that you see in this photo. The autopsy on Watson showed that there were two large holes in his skull. Now, his body was so decomposed that it was hard to tell if these holes were caused by either a hammer, a pick, or even a pistol. Deputies were going with the story that either the dairy worker or the three other boys that worked at the dairy farm stole some money and that Watson pretty much tattled on one of them, causing one of the suspects to kill Watson in retaliation. So the deputies had the three young boys who lived in the juvenile home, the dairy worker, and the man who found the body along the Salado Creek in jail for investigation. On November 17, 1933, the San Antonio Light mentions that dairy worker Jesus Samodillo confessed to the killing of Charles Allen Watson. In this article, it has his written statement on how he killed Charles Allen Watson, which I'll read to you now. On November 2nd, I asked Alan why he did not wash his milk cans as the boss gets mad when you don't wash them. 
He cursed me and used abusive language, and at that moment I got so mad I did not know what I was doing, and I reached over and got a piece of one inch pipe about 12 inches long, and I hit him over the head twice. He fell and did not move, and I picked him up and carried him to the bullpen and laid him under the shed. This was about 5 p.m. When I got to my room, it was about 5.30, and I changed my shirt and pants as they had blood on them, and I went to the dining room of the home for the age, and I ate my supper and went back to my room and put the bloody clothes back on. Then I went back to the bullpen and picked up Alan Watson's body and went through the cow lane, through the cow pen to a dry creek that runs through an open field and laid the body down so I could rest. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I picked up the body, went on through the field, down under the hill to a path that runs up to the Salado Creek to a point just above a big pecan tree. I laid the body down on the bank of the creek and let it slide down the bank into the creek. After I put the body in the creek, I took the piece of iron pipe out of my pocket and threw it in the creek. I then went back to my room and took off the bloody shirt and pants, washed my shirt, and hid the pants between the mattress and springs of the bed. The bloody stained trousers which officers found in his room, Samadio admitted, were those that he wore. Samadio also identified the pipe, which was found later on in the Salado Creek. Samadio then closes his statement with this, I am telling this of my own free will because I want to tell the truth and get it off my conscience. The three young boys from the juvenile boys' home that were held in custody all had written statements saying that Samadio confessed to them that he hit Watson and that if they were to say anything about it that they would get the same treatment. The deputies believed what the boys were saying because during questioning, the boys were separated all day long and had no time to get together to come up with a story. And when they got their written statements, all three statements were pretty much identical. On November 22, 1933, a news article mentions that Jesus Samadio claimed that he was crazy when he killed Charles Allen Watson, so they wanted to make sure that he was sane to stand trial. When the test was conducted around December of 1933, they did find Jesus Samadio sane, and he was sent back to jail to await trial. In January 8, 1934, Jesus Samadio was found guilty of killing Charles Allen Watson and was given a life sentence. Here is the death certificate of Charles Allen Watson. On the bottom left, it mentions that he is buried at Mission Burial Park. Since this channel is mainly about cemeteries, I wanted to go and check out his grave for myself. So according to this map, he should be in the section where the last name Palmer is. However, he should be buried somewhere over here. Again, he died on November 2nd, 1933. And we all we have all these year of deaths as 1933. And he is somewhere on section four. However, I see no grave marker with his name. I've walked around here many times looking for Charles Allen Watson or Allen Watson, and his tombstone is nowhere to be found. It could have been right here, or it could have been there or here, somewhere in this section, but there is no grave marker. Interesting. We now jump forward to the 1960s, and the Home for the Aged is now mentioned in newspapers as the South End Sanatorium, or Convalescent Home. What started off as a county farm to take care of the county's poor has become a first-rate nursing home. The article also states that the South End Sanatorium had provided a home for about 200 primarily medically dependent people, ranging in the age from 18 to 104, but averaging 70 years old. Here are the few of the many patients that lived at the Southern Sanatorium enjoying a night out bowling. One that I would like to mention is Amanda Harris, who died at the age of 117 on May 29, 1961. She lived at the old Bear County Poor Farm and moved to the new home for the aged in 1915 and lived there up until her death in 1961. While doing my research, I found out that the juvenile home on the county farm closed on March 1st, 1968, 
after moving into a new facility in downtown. From the San Antonio Express News on December 11, 1968, an article states that Bear County decides to close South End Sanatorium. In this article, it states that the closing of South End Sanatorium was going to save the county $300,000, and that the patients of the sanatorium would receive better care once they're transferred to other facilities inside San Antonio. It also states that the South End Sanatorium didn't have enough manpower to take care of its patients, and that most of them needed therapy not available at the South End Sanatorium. In order to get South End running in minimal shape, it would require $200,000. An article from the San Antonio Express News on February 19, 1969, mentions that the 8th floor of the new Bear County Hospital was ready for the transfer of patients from the South End Sanatorium. On February 28, 1969, the last 18 of the 223 patients of the South End Sanatorium were moved out completely. The patients at the South End Sanatorium had a hard time leaving the facility. What started off as a home for the age in 1915 had now closed its doors after 54 years of service, and the county farm just sat abandoned. With the South and Sanatorium and Juvenile Boys Home now abandoned, there are many ideas on what should be done with the property. Now, the only reason I could find of people thinking that this place was an insane asylum was this article here on March of 1969 that says that the San Antonio State Hospital was looking for a temporary to permanent residence for more patients of the state hospital. Now, I can't confirm or deny that maybe the South End facility was used for a short period of time for an overflow of the San Antonio State Hospital, but I can confirm that the old juvenile boys' school was leased to the Alcoholic Rehabilitation Center sometime after the sanatorium closed in February of 1969. A news article from December 6, 1970 mentions that the ARC was looking to expand into the old South End Convalescent Home and Tuberculosis Hospital making no mention of any insane asylum or state hospital on the property. Here is a picture of the entrance of the Alcoholic Rehabilitation Center, otherwise known as the ARC on South End Road. And here is a picture of what it looks like today, which is now known as Lifetime Recovery. It still serves its purpose of alcoholic rehabilitation as well as drug rehabilitation. What's really interesting to me is that a piece of the old county farm is still being put into good use today. In May of 1970, UTSA was looking for land to place their new main campus at. Out of the 10 sites considered, Bear County was willing to give the old county farm on South End and Farm Road to UTSA. But of course, UTSA decided to build their main campus on 1604 near Babcock Road. The county commissioners felt that UTSA made a bad choice because the county farm on South End Road already had plumbing and electrical on the site. One interesting idea was brought up about the old county farm site and that was mentioned in November 11, 1970, where county commissioner suggested that a new major football stadium be built on the site. This stadium would hold up to 50 to 60,000 people, and he felt that San Antonio should get behind this because this could attract a major football league to come into the city. However, this never happened. I feel like the county had a hard time selling the property on South End and Farm Road, just like they did with the old Bear County Poor Farm property, and this is my reason why. In a news article from May 30th, 1974, the county commissioner's court made a ruling saying that they needed to remove the 2,000 remains from the old county farm site on South End and Farm Road. Also, they were looking for a cemetery that would be willing to accept these remains and were accepting bids from undertaking companies who would be willing to dig up these graves and rebury them at a new cemetery. The county commissioners thought that by removing these graves, that they could sell this property for at least $1 million. Eventually, on September 19, 1974, they were finally removing the graves from the old county farm on South End Farm Road. And here is a picture of one of the many graves that were dug up on this site. The article also mentions that 75% of the remains at this cemetery were of baby remains. And it also states that the records were so horrendous that they don't know exactly how many people were buried at that cemetery. So it's quite possible that maybe some remains were left behind on this site. Lastly, it explains that the remains would be in better care once they're transferred to a perpetual care cemetery somewhere in San Antonio. The last article I could find about the old county farm on South End and Farm Road was this article from July of 1976, which mentions that the Bear County Juvenile Detention Center 
was looking to reopen the old juvenile boys' home to relieve crowding from their detention center in downtown. The estimated cost to reopen this facility was around $250,000, and upon further research, I couldn't find any news about the reopening of this facility. However, sometime in the future, they did build a new juvenile detention center right next to the old property, which you saw earlier in the video. I decided to go back in time by using the historicaerials.com website to check on the progression of the abandonment of this old county farm. Circled in red near the home for the age and boys home are these buildings here which I'm not sure what they were used for. Now jumping forward to 1986, you can see that the building next to the home for the age on the top of your screen is demolished. And jumping forward to present day 2021 on Google Maps, you can see that all that remains is the home for the aged, boys home, and the workshop. For over 50 years now, the home for the age which was built in 1915 to replace the dilapidated old poor farm on present day North St. Mary's and Mulberry Street has been sitting abandoned and forgotten in time. The same goes for the juvenile home for boys, where troubled young men were to go to reform themselves by learning a trade, helping out on the county farm, and to make something out of themselves. To me this county farm was more of an opportunity type of farm where poor and indigent people had the opportunity to live and work on a farm, while boys who were troubled had a chance to work on themselves and become a functioning member of society. Here is a clip of one of the buildings of the farm. As you can see, the walls are completely tagged and it's in complete disrepair. Now mind you, this building was built in 1915 and it contains asbestos, so I totally wouldn't recommend walking in here without the proper gear. This great drone footage from YouTuber Unknown Ventures shows the present state of the buildings on the county site. Passing by the old juvenile boys home is the home for the aged. These buildings and the land that it's on is still owned by Bear County. Today, Bear County Sheriff's Department uses this site as a training facility. That is why it is so hard to get onto this site today. Now call it what you want, an abandoned insane asylum, home for the aged, juvenile boys home, South and Sanatorium, whatever. This building has so much history, and I'm sure that there are spirits or ghosts that are attached to this building from the past. If these walls could talk, I'm sure that it could share more information that I don't even know about or that I couldn't even find. To us San Antonians, this building will always be mysterious, creepy, and interesting to explore if you're up for the challenge. I hope you enjoyed my investigation into the comprehensive history and factual evidence of these abandoned buildings. If you have any comments about the history of this place or want to share your experience in exploring these abandoned buildings, please feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. And as always, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.